Good morning. It's wonderful to be with you again. A um, couple things. When Craig had that picture of me with the goats, I was so afraid he was going to say something about the old goat and the new goats. <laughs> But he knew that I was going to speak after him, so he had, had to be a little, a little careful about that. And then when he said that I was a big influence about paradox using the lectionary, I thought, oh, wow, well, that's all fine and good well, during the season of Advent and Christmas. But just wait till you're in the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. <laughs> then you'll think, when is this ever over? But I thought one way I could redeem myself is I always preach a lot shorter than Craig. <laughs> so, well, last time I was here, um, Craig wasn't here, and he made a video and read a letter that he sent that he had for me, which I was very moved and, and so appreciated. So I thought I'll write a letter to my friends here at Paradox. Dear Paradox friends, I am delighted and honored to be with you again. I told a friend that I was preaching here and she asked, what is that church like? And after some thought, the word that came to mind was fearless. She wondered what I meant by that and so I told her, you are fearless in the way you practice radical hospitality and welcome. In a culture where we see more and more divisions and wall building, this community embraces everyone with open arms and open hearts. In your statements of affirmation, you talk about LGBTIQA persons, women's empowerment, and anti-racism, but you also live it out. You put flesh and bones on it in your life together. You are fearless in worship. The music, leadership by all ages, engagement with the biblical text, even contradictions, the quality of your online presence and more makes worship an experience of joy in the presence of God and one another. Your leaders are fearless. Elders and trustees who deal with routine matters and, like every church, difficult issues, but do so with wisdom and grace. Gifted musicians and teachers and hospitality hosts and tech people and so many more, you are here not to be served, but to serve. And I must mention the fearless, fearlessness of your pastor. In 38 years of preaching, I have never even thought about preaching on the book of Leviticus. <laughs> Much more done it. Fearless, or maybe just crazy. <laughs> As I've gotten to know Craig, I have learned that this is a person who is humble and funny, a serious scholar, is willing to try something new, and if needed, ask for forgiveness, able to juggle the competing needs of a congregation, and most important, he loves this church. He loves you. I am confident that paradox, as you further grow into the church God needs in this time and place, you will fearlessly follow and live out your faith in the one who says, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. Love, Pastor Kim. Thank you. So when I preach, I always start with a word of prayer, and most often I use a prayer from Psalm 19. And the reason I do it is because in the back of my mind, I always think, well, this lets me off the hook a little bit, because it says what happens here is not a monologue, but a trilogue between God and me and you. You all have a part in this. Um, you will take whatever is said, not just by me, but through the musicians, the prayers, the readings, and you and God are going to do business with that and make it your own. Yes. So if you'll pray with me these words from Psalm 19. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth 
and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, Craig talked about the book of Isaiah and how it's thought that it's made up really of three books, first Isaiah, second Isaiah, and third Isaiah, each addressing specific times and circumstances of the people to whom it was written, but it's all held together by the common theme of the presence and love of God. Now, all three were written after the split of the United Kingdom. Remember, he talked about that in the north was the kingdom of Israel, and the south, the kingdom of Judah. So last week, Craig preached on a text from 1st Isaiah that addressed the situation of those in Israel and the threat of the Assyrians that was about to overtake their country. And today, the word is from 2nd Isaiah. And it is a word to the southern kingdom, to Judah. In 586 BC, the Babylonian armies of Nebuchadnezzar swept into Judah and captured its capital, um, Jerusalem. They then deported 15,000 of its most skilled citizens back to Babylon. Imagine. But you know, for some, Babylon wasn't all that bad. I mean, they were allowed to live in separate neighborhoods and worship Yahweh right along with the Babylonian gods. And you know, it's not such a bad thing to offer a few things to those Babylonian gods, you know, just keep your options open. Life was good. And it didn't take long for them to assimilate and become yet another Babylonian of foreign descent rather than an exile in a strange land. But for others, all of it was bad. They just couldn't get Jerusalem out of their minds. They remained exiles by choice. They refused to assimilate, to learn the language of their captors, to adopt any of the customs which would help, fit, help them fit in. They kept to themselves, which kept them from sharing in the prosperity that surrounded them, and they kept to their God. Yahweh, the king of the universe, refusing to acknowledge or worship any other. Now, the Babylonians saw these exiles as strange people with really strange customs, uh, circumcision, but also as very stupid people because they just turned their backs on the riches that were there for the picking. But the exiles, they saw themselves as a holy remnant, a righteous few who were, not, who were necessarily aliens in the full sense of the word. They did not and never could belong because their hearts belonged in Jerusalem and they longed for home. And so they sang songs. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows, though, we hung up our lyres, for our captors required of us songs and our tormentors mirth, saying, sing us one of those songs of Zion. Huh. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And they ask questions. We have risked and sacrificed so much in order to be faithful. How can God be so unfaithful? Why has God abandoned us? Why has God left us to rot in this foreign land? And so it was to these exiles in the wilderness of Babylon that the prophet Isaiah said, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad and the desert shall rejoice and blossom. Say to those who are fearful heart, be strong, do not fear, here is your God will come and save you. And to those who felt abandoned by God, the promise was remembered. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. It was to those who longed for home that hope was spoken. 
And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sign shall flee away. And you know, it was enough. I mean, home was still hundreds of miles away and they still didn't fit in and their hearts still ached for the sight of Zion. But they had this promise. And it was enough. It was enough to get them through and to keep them faithful until that day when they would once again walk the streets of their beloved Jerusalem. So this is the second week in a row that our Advent Gospel calls us to attention for John the Baptist, as if the only path to the manger runs through John. Now in chapter 3, that Craig dealt with last week, John stands out even by biblical standards and not just because of his diet of locusts and honey. He was bold and brash, full of bravado, fearlessly calling out and insulting the opposition and those in power, calling them to repentance and to a baptism for forgiveness of sin. Now I've always wondered the people that put together this lectionary, what were they thinking? Two weeks of John the Baptist? Where's the Christmas trees? Where's the light? He doesn't fit in with this whole Christmas vibe, does he? I mean, think about it. Nobody puts the scary figures of John the Baptist railing at the opposition next to the sweet little lambs in the nativity set. No one brings brownies made with locusts to the company potluck. And I can't imagine anyone sending a Christmas card with John the Baptist on the front. During this wonderful time of love and joy, my thoughts turn to you and your family. You brood of vipers. The axe is lying at the foot of the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be thrown into the fire. Merry Christmas. <laughs> but today our text is from John, uh, Matthew chapter 11, and it is a very different John we meet, one who is broken and now rotting in one of Herod's prisons. You see, King Herod had seduced his brother's wife, and that was not to be tolerated, and John made sure that he could never forget that. Herod's new wife demanded that John be thrown into prison, and Herod was only too happy to please his new wife and give her this belated wedding present. Now, for any person, prison is a horrible place. But for John, it must have been even more so, John was a child of the desert. All his life he lived in wide open spaces with the wind on his face and the stars as his roof. But now he was confined to a small underground cell. For a man who didn't even live in a house, this must have been pure agony. And so maybe it was one day one day, and his body ached from not even being able to have room to stretch his arms, and his nostrils burned from the stench of his cell. A day when he himself was beginning to wonder if he was just crazy to have ever believed this stuff about the kingdom of heaven and justice and righteousness. Or maybe he was just stupid to have ever thought that God would indeed keep God's promises and set God's people free. And so maybe it was one day, on that kind of day, that John called to his followers and whispered through a parched mouth and cracked lips, go to Jesus, go to Jesus and ask him, are you the one sent from God? Are you the Messiah who comes to set God's people free? And if you are the one, why am I in chains? Why am I still in prison? I need to know. Is it you, Lord? And so to this wide-eyed prophet of God, Jesus sent a message. Now, it wasn't a bunch of Bible texts that proved he was the fulfillment of prophecy. 
It wasn't some deep theological treatise on the nature of the pre-existence Christ. Now, John's word, uh, Jesus' word to John's disciples was really very simple. You go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. And when John heard it, it was enough. I mean, John was still in prison. He knew that not all the blind nor all the deaf could, were healed, but he also knew that the promise was being kept, that something was happening, something radically new was coming, something marvelous was beginning, and nothing would ever be able to stop it. And in that moment, on that day, it was enough. He pressed his body up against the bars of his prison and shouted at the top of his lungs, prepare the way of the Lord. Now I'm guessing that probably all of us at some time have felt like exiles, like strangers in a strange land, far from home or a sense of home. Some place where we feel secure and comfortable and known and loved. We long for peace both outside of us and also within us. And so we, from time to time, have asked the exile's question. If I am one of God's children, then why has God abandoned me? Why does God feel so far off and remote? Why do I feel so alone? And I also guess that most at times we have all felt like prisoners, held captive in cells, not of brick and mortar, but of broken dreams and bitter disappointments, painful memories and deep despair. Even as others prepare to celebrate this Christmas season, we cannot escape our imprisonment so that the joy and peace of this season remains elusive and out of reach. And so we ask the prisoner's question. If you are the one Lord, then why am I not free? If you are the one Lord, then why is there so much hate in this world? Why do nations war against the innocents? Why do the stomachs of the hungry still rumble? Big questions, aren't they? Weighty and troubling questions that the faithful has struggled with in every time and place. Questions that are heard, that are whispered in all of scripture. Why God? Where are you, God? Now you've begun your journey with these lectionary readings, and for the next year, most of your gospel readings will come from the book of Matthew. Now in the first chapter of Matthew, we are told that the baby Mary bears in her womb, his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And the very last chapter of Matthew, the very last verse of Matthew, Jesus promises, I am with you always. From the beginning to the end, Matthew wants you to know, Matthew wants you to know that you're not alone, that God is with us, and that we can trust the promise. Now, now a promise, a promise has its own kind of reality, an already not yet kind of reality. For instance, when I make a promise to you, that reality already exists between us. But when I keep that promise, it exists in its fullness. Or when a person is pregnant, they're already a parent. But when that child is born, their parenthood takes on an even greater reality. <laughs> Boy, does it. This world is pregnant with God's presence and promise. We just have to have our eyes open and our ears tuned to be a part of it. And so how do we do that? Well, at churches where I have served, I start every meeting by asking a question. Where have you seen signs of God's gracious love? 
Where have you seen God's presence and promise? And when I start asking that question, way back when I would begin, people would say the big things. You know, someone came home for the hospital or somebody else got a new job. But as we kept doing this, they started to mention some of the smaller things, easy to overlook, but signs of God's love and presence in the day-to-day -day happenings of life. Things like the budding of a tree or the laughter of children, the warmth of a sun, a good night's sleep. And then at times, unexpected and surprising things. Finally being able to let go a long-held grudge or being forgiven for a long past hurt inflicted or even sitting at the Christmas table and seeing the empty chair of someone we loved and f amazingly feeling a peace that defies all understanding. Holding on to the promise of Emmanuel, God with us and for us, we'll see our cups not half empty or half full, but overflowing with signs of God's gracious love. But we know still our questions linger. Why God? Why is this happening? And so those nights when I'm haunted by the sorrows of this world and the noise of these questions, I work at holding on to another promise, this one from 1 Corinthians 13. Now we see in a mirror dimly. You know when you get out of a hot shower and the mirror is all fogged up and full of whatever that is, the mist? <laughs> Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now, I'm not going to have answers to my questions, but the promise is that one day I will have those answers. And so I've always kind of liked to think of heaven, not so much the full of angels singing, da, 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 but the sound of people saying, oh, oh, okay. Okay, now I, now I can see it. Now I can understand. I get it. The promise is that one day all our questions will be answered. But for now, we cling to the promise. And so on this third Sunday at Advent, God says to exiles with weak hands and fearful hearts, be strong. Do not fear. Here is your God who will come and save you. God's not far off, but as present, as near as your next breath. God does not turn a deaf ear to our pain and suffering, our questions and doubts, but is with us. Emmanuel, coming not with explanations, but with love. And on this third Sunday in Advent, God says to those who are in prison, to those cut off from life, to those who ask, is it you, Lord? God says, look and tell me what you see. Here in this place, Christ's name are all, all are welcomed. All are celebrated in their God-given personhood. All are given to, re to enrich and enliven this community. Here, with patient understanding, tears and hugs, joy is shared. And beyond these walls, through hands and hearts reaching out to those in need and help, hope is shared. And for now, for this day, it is enough. The promise is being kept. Something is happening. Something radically new and marvelous is beginning. The kingdom of God is here and nothing's going to stop it. It is enough to give us peace in the midst of sorrow. It is enough, these signs of God's gracious love, to get us through the deepest darkness because we've seen the light. And it is enough to keep us faithful until that day when all our questions are answered and all our tears are wiped away and all joy and peace are ours. So for today, we look and we pray and we long for that day. But for today, we cling 
to the promise. The promise of a babe born in a wooden manger and sealed with the blood of a man on a wooden cross. And it is enough.